Located in the northern part of the ancient kingdom of Mesopotamia, in the middle valley of the Harbour River, the archaeological site of Tel Atij dates from 2800 to 2500 BC, the Early Bronze Age, during a period known as the Ninevite Five. A team of archaeologists from Laval University in Quebec, directed by Michel Fortin, carried out five excavation seasons on this site between 1986 and 1993. They discovered, as well as houses and various other structures, a large quantity of objects fashioned in ceramics, baked clay, polished stone and bronze, and about 4,000 objects in chipped stone. The research we have carried out since 1993 on these chipped stone tools has revealed the very special role they played. It was in 1930 in the Palestinian cave Ed Tuarmin, the French archaeologist Neuville discovered the first Canaanian blades. This type of stone tool was completely unknown at this time and consisted of long, regularly shaped blades. The morphology of these pieces, in other words their regular dimensions, their trapezoidal shaped section, their straight edged profile, bear witness to an astounding degree of standardization. However, what most intrigued researchers at that time was not the shape of these tools, but rather their age. In fact, these blades came from archaeological levels dating back to the beginning of the historical period, which was the beginning of the Early Bronze Age, about 2800 BC a period in which specialists had assumed that this type of material no longer played a role. Because of their geographical origin, Neuville attributed the name of Canaanian blades to these post-Stone Age tools, and in the absence of any expertise to analyze them, he assumed they were stone sickle blades. In the years that followed, thousands of Canaanian blades were discovered during numerous archaeological excavations which took place in the four corners of the Middle East. Thus, Canaanian blades, dating from the Chalcolithic and Bronze Ages, were discovered in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and even in Egypt. Despite the absence of any scientific proof, the belief that these were sickle blades continued. However, no systematic study had been made which could demonstrate whether this assumption was correct. In fact, both the technology used to make these superb pieces, as well as the real manner in which they were used, remained a mystery for over 50 years. Since 1993, various researchers have studied these blades, allowing us to build up expertise and a means of analysis specially adapted to these stone tools. We need to understand the role they played in the everyday life of the people who made them and traded with them. We see that these Canaanian blades from Kutan in Iraq and from Kashkashok and Gudeda in Syria are very similar. The blades are usually glossy, which gives us information concerning their use. We also note that many have heavy traces of bitumen remains opposite their glossed edge. These bitumen remains tell us that the tools were not used alone, but were glued into handles or into another kind of instrument, as part of a much larger tool. Seeing the gloss on the edge of these blades led many archaeologists to assume that they made up the cutting edge of a sickle. However, there are many problems with this hypothesis. One is the nature of the use traces themselves. We can determine the function of these objects by looking at the gloss on their cutting edge under a microscope. This shows us diagnostic use traces of the friction of the tool against the worked material, often allowing us to make fine distinctions concerning what material the tool was used on. The traces on a blade used to harvest cereals in a sickle is very different from traces on the Canaanian blades. 
The surface is smooth and flat and has fine striations from tiny particles rolling against the edge as it cuts. There is no roughening or tearing away of particles from the surface. The wear is smooth and shiny. So the hypothesis was put forward that these tools were used in sickles. But the image on the screen, showing the traces on these blades when seen under a microscope, contradicts this hypothesis. It should have a smooth, bright appearance with fine striae. However, this blade from Talatij, like all the other Canaanian blades, gives a very different image. Large areas of the flint surface show torn out parts rather like dark comet-shaped forms torn from the flint surface as we see here. And there is a certain roughness in the appearance of the traces. The surface is not smooth and flat like after sickle harvesting. These two blades, like the hundreds of others Patricia Anderson and other researchers have examined under the microscope, do not have traces like those created by harvesting cereals. Rather, they are like those we find on blades used in a tribulum or a threshing sledge. However, the traditional threshing sledge consists of a board with grooves cut into the underside, into which are inserted numerous small flint flakes. Wood was rare in Mesopotamia during this time, and people used what was locally available in the area. What wood was available? There was poplar, willow, and other trees, all with trunks too narrow to be used to produce planks. Narrow staves were produced from these trees and were bound together using leather straps. Teeth, as the early cuneiform tablets call them, but which were undoubtedly flint blades, were then inserted into the interstices between the wooden staves and were held in place using the bitumen or tar available in the region. We have the first true record of the use of these instruments in cuneiform tablets dating from 2500 BC to the beginning of the second millennium BC. They were used to thresh cereals on the threshing floor. It was therefore quite evident that the Canaanian blades held a significant quantity of information concerning life in the 3rd and 4th millennia BC, and that it was urgent to construct an approach specially adapted to make these important witnesses speak. Within the framework of this research, we originated an interdisciplinary expertise, a methodology which allowed us to rediscover the social and economic context in which this material lived. Thus our research allowed us to understand the role of these tools. The technological research informs us of the technical advancement of the stone nappers. In the case of the production of the Canaanian blades, the technique used at the time, involving pressure applied by a lever to large flint cores, is a true innovation. However, in about 2500 BC, this technique disappeared completely waiting to be rediscovered only in the 1990s in the course of more than 10 years experimental research. We can see the great regularity of the ridges and the cutting edges. Certain blades are broken at both extremities and we can therefore deduce that these elements are segments or fragments of blades which were originally much longer but intentionally broken. We can thus reconstruct what must have been originally one of the large blades before they were broken into these three parts. We needed to reconstruct what must have been the mode of manufacture of the very large blades used to produce these large regular segments. At the Lyra Center in Denmark, we carried out manufacturing trials of such kinds of very long blades. A first step consisted of preparing heavy flint cores from which blades of 20 to 30 centimeters could be struck. This is a difficult step, requiring much care and expertise, and was thus probably the work of specialists. First, a large nodule of stone needs to be shaped using a stone hammer. 
Then, numerous flakes are removed using indirect percussion in order to regularize the form of the core, which is often triangular in section. Then, after a final regularization of the core, the napping of long blades can begin. Two techniques were used according to the known workshops, which were about a dozen in Europe and the Near East. One is indirect percussion, done with carefully adapted tools, here using a deer antler and a heavy stone billet. The second is pressure flaking, using a lever. The lever allows an exponential increase of the force, in this instance a pressure of several hundred kilograms. This technique implies an immobilization of the core, ideally a hollowed out tree trunk, and the use of an intermediary piece which is both resistant and flexible. Here it is a deer antler being used. But this could also be a piece of hard wood with a pointed copper tip. Examination of the archaeological tools shows that they were made from blades which were very probably napped by pressure using a lever and a copper tipped point. Here are blades like these made using a very similar flint from the southwest of France. Blades similar to these, fragmented by percussion on an anvil, were made to arm the experimental tribulum. Jacques Chabot, a specialist in chipstone tools found in Bronze Age villages in Mesopotamia, tells us that he has applied observations from these studies to discover which tools were made by local artisans and which were the work of specialists residing elsewhere. These specialists made Canaanian blades which were transported to different villages by way of trade networks. The very presence of Canaanian blades shows us the impressive geographic magnitude of their trade and use over the entire northern Mesopotamian region. It was by comparing marks found on archaeological tools with similar marks on experimentally made ones that we were able to diagnose techniques used by ancient peoples. We have a short description, or more exactly elements of a description, in a poem called The Sumerian Farmer's Almanac or the instructions of God to the laborer. It is a poem where we see enter an instrument for which the description is very brief. God recommends to his disciple, or laborer, to prepare his material well. And this material consists of several essential components. The wood, the leather bindings or thongs, and the bitumen. The last component is the teeth for the instrument. If we now consult the administrative archives, we have just quoted a poem, but administrative archives give us the reality, we can find several brief indications concerning the teeth. One cuneiform tablet mentions that 40 teeth, without specifying their nature, were used in a threshing sledge. That is just one example. Other cuneiform tablets cite a few more, one quoting 48 or 50 teeth, another 80. Nonetheless, these are the essential indicators at our disposal. And this threshing sledge resembles all the others, except, of course, that the components are different in appearance. Whether its framework be made of boards or of staves lashed together like a raft is of little importance. Both function in exactly the same way.
The idea of putting bitumen between the wooden staves rather than in grooves is not illogical once we imagine this instrument as a raft-like structure or sledge as described in the cuneiform tablets rather than made of planks. Also, when we see that the blades of this period are highly standardized in shape and size, we see that the structure of this sledge would have been unstable if blades of various widths and thicknesses had been inserted into its structure. It is also incredible to see how very many blades, about a thousand we have examined so far, have the same kind of traces of use as seen under the microscope as the teeth of threshing sledges which were used in recent times throughout the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern regions. In the case of this sledge, the wood has gone, the leather has of course disappeared, but we still have the bitumen and the blades. When studying the blades from Kashkashok in Syria, it was fortunate that one of the blades had retained thick traces of bitumen which were moulded into a kind of cast, revealing the shape of the part of the instrument against which it had rested. As we see here, the blade was fixed into a kind of depression and the bitumen carries an imprint of a wooden surface, the shape of which shows that the tool and bitumen rested against a rounded pole or stave. This imprint confirms the structure of the sledge we are currently making and concurs with the description in the written records of the time. <laughs> Sickles with flint blades were quite rare at the time described in the cuneiform tablets. Sickle cutting edges were made in copper or bronze. Sickles were weighed and distributed in the morning, then collected and weighed again at the end of the day to avoid any fraud. Metal was a very rare and precious commodity. The principal cereal was barley, emma wheat, and of lesser importance, bread wheat. Barley and emma were hulled grain. After harvest, the grain was further dried. They made sheaves, assembled into six meters by six meters square, so that the cereals dried in the field. The chief of the cultivation declared these cereals dry enough for threshing. The sheaves were transported to the threshing floor using draught animals such as equids or by boat when this was possible using canals. They prepared this instrument, the threshing sledge. The sheaves were spread on the threshing floor in several layers. So here we have inserted the blades in a way which corresponds both to the numbers used, as cited in the tablets, and the shape, dimensions and two patterns of insertion which we find in the archaeological record. There are blades found which have bitumen and use traces distribution which show that they were inserted alone, without another blade touching them. Other blades are found in these sites with bitumen still holding them together as we see here in this example. Study of the wear traces on these blades under the microscope confirms that they function mounted together in the threshing sledge in this way, connected with their ends touching, held together by the bitumen. We therefore tested both kinds of spacing of the blades to see how traces formed on them during use and to see whether these traces resembled the traces on the archaeological blades. The sledge structure is small but the cutting surface of all the blades together is great. We found our sledge too small to carry a person, so a stone was used to increase the total weight from 20 kilograms to an optimal 40 kilograms. Either with oxen or equids, the instrument was pulled continuously in a circle and the cereals were threshed and chopped. Come
bien laver une aire de battage, de dépiquage, où on rassemble après la poisson. C'est trop, c'est trop bas. Il fait que trop, pas assez là. Each estate had a threshing floor. The harvest was assembled there, and the grain, which had been removed from the straw and chaff by the working of the threshing sledge, was extracted by winnowing and sieving. The grain remained for a short time on the threshing floor. The blades were fixed using bitumen or tar, which was simply heated and poured into the interstices of the staves of the threshing sledge. This gave an astounding stability to the flint inserts and increased the sliding properties of the sledge. The traces found on these blades are exactly the same as those found on the Canaanian blades from archaeological excavations. The grain was left to dry, then it was transported by boat to large grain silos which had a large capacity and could hold about 700 tons of grain. The silos were filled to the top, then sealed with mud. Grain could be stored in this way over long periods of time. These silos, as well as most of the buildings in the site, were built using clay bricks which contained large quantities of straw. This chopped straw reveals traces of the work of the tribulum in the form of phytoliths, silica imprints of the chopped plants as seen under the microscope. After being chopped by the blades of the threshing sledge, the cut profile of the straw and of the corresponding phytoliths are very clear, smooth and regular, not jagged or crushed appearing as they are after using other methods of cutting. Microscopic study of phytolith remains in animal dung found in sites show that not only grain was used to feed animals, but also straw chopped by the tribunal. Analysis done in the past on stone tools was not adapted to these periods. Archaeologists had never considered that the threshing sledge was used in such ancient times. But it was our research on the tribulum, confirmed by tablets to be already in common use 5,000 years ago, which put us on the trail of the most ancient origin of the threshing sledge. Today, we know some form of this composite agricultural tool appeared even seven or 8,000 years ago in Syria and Iraq. The rediscovery of the tribulum is the fruit of a unique cooperation among several researchers working in different disciplines. This rediscovery reflects the cumulative and shared experiences of these same researchers. The data were discovered from traces, flint tools, earliest written records in cuneiform on baked clay tablets, and by perseverance and by meeting the present-day inhabitants in their traditional landscapes. The tribulum reveals a forgotten culture of 8,000 years ago, when people first imagined a tool which is still in use today. <laughs>